Hi, how's it going? Um, my name is Dalton Caldwell, and I'm a partner at Y Combinator. So I'll just get to it. Um, so just a quick overview of Y Combinator. Uh, it was started in 2005, and since then, we've funded over 950 startups, so uh, quite a few. Um, here's some of the better known ones. Um, Airbnb and Reddit are probably the best known in terms of consumer traction, but um, we've had pretty good companies so far. Um, this si we, we fund companies in batches, and there's two batches a year. Uh, last batch, there was 114 startups in it. And so the scale that we operate at is quite large. Uh, we see every kind of startup idea, every kind of founding team that you can think of. Um, and so that gives us a pretty uh, unique perspective. In terms of the community itself, there's over 2,000 founders that have made up uh, all the companies we've funded over time. And again, there's folks with every kind of expertise you can think of uh, from, from all over the world. And so the community is one of the things that um, is the biggest advantage of being a Y Combinator company is there's always someone uh, an, that's an expert on any topic. One thing that folks don't realize, um, and this is one of the reasons we've been traveling more, is that we have quite a bit of international presence uh, in the batches. And so this is just from, from the winter 15 batch. Uh, all, the, all the countries listed here um, had at least one company where they're, where they're from that country. And so you can see uh, Turkey's in there somewhere, uh, but you, you know, it's folks from all over the world. And so, again, people think that maybe Y Combinator is not uh, a good choice for them if they're outside of the US, and that's simply not true. You don't need an introduction. You don't need to go to London first. Uh, we definitely fund people uh, that fly directly from wherever they are in the world. Uh, I just I looked this up uh, when I was preparing this talk yesterday, and actually the past three batches we've had companies uh, from Turkey, and I believe all three of these came back after. And so the reason I bring this up is a lot of folks think that uh, if you're funded by Y Combinator, you have to come and live in California, you have to live in the Bay Area for the long run. And again, that's not true. Uh, these folks, I believe, all are in Istanbul, actually. Uh, I know Zeppelin is, and they. They started the company there, they did Y Combinator, they came to California, they got the network there, and then they went back to their home market. So again, I just want to mention this because I think a lot of people think about the big companies that are based in Silicon Valley and they don't realize uh, how, how we are really interested in funding these types of companies outside of the valley. The takeaway is good companies are everywhere. <laughs> okay, so let's get to the meat of the talk, which is how to come up with and evaluate startup ideas. And this may seem pretty basic, uh, but the fact is, no matter how hard you work in an idea, if the idea is just not good, uh, it's not going to work. And so I think not enough time and effort is spent talking about how to evaluate ideas. Uh, rather, a lot of what people talk about in, in conferences and whatnot is fundraising. And that's only a small part of the overall aspect of building a startup. So here's a few questions that you might want to ask yourself when you're evaluating an idea. First of all, do people want this? And again, this may seem very obvious, this may seem like a very basic thing to say, but the number one reason a startup doesn't work is because people don't want the product that that startup is making. And want this uh, doesn't mean, oh, that sounds nice, I might, that's a nice to have, or oh, I guess that sounds okay. It's do people really want the product uh, that, that you're making? And in fact, at Y Combinator, the t-shirts that we give all of our founders uh, right on the front, it says, make something people want, right? This is so important to us, and it's, very, it's a very simple thing, but we ask this, I ask this myself all the time when I'm meeting with companies, is I try to get back to the basics of, well, you're having these problems in the market. Are you sure people want it? And it's astonishing how many problems, when you really reduce them down to the essence, are that the startup is making something that people ultimately don't actually want. Second, and this was kind of brought up in the pri prior talk, has anyone tried this before? Um, often you see uh, startups uh, do no research whatsoever about who has tried their idea before and if they were successful or unsuccessful, right? When I ask a founder uh, about their company, ask if there's any competitors, if they say no one's ever done this before, um, they're probably either wrong or crazy, uh, or, you know, or it's a bad idea, right? Uh, most likely people have tried it before, and there's a lot to learn from the prior efforts. And so you should definitely be asking yourself this and try to really take to heart the lessons from the folks that have tried it before when you're evaluating a startup idea. And if, no one, if really no one has tried it before, there's a good chance that people don't actually want it. Um, additionally, uh, what, are your, what are your insights into the problem? 
right? Uh, again, this, he brought this up in the last talk, but why, why are you the team to be able to tackle this problem? Often start, uh, startups are founded by people that just want to start a company for the sake of doing it, and they have no particular expertise or insight into the thing they're working on. Um, and those are tough uh, because uh, there's a good chance those founders don't know more than the average Joe on the street about that problem. Um, what's really great is when you have a team that has very specific insights um, into what the problem is they're trying to solve, where they would be the customer of the product themselves, and they're just building a product to scratch their own itch. Um, this, this is a good thing to do, as well as things um, in biotech or medicine or things like that, you definitely need a team that has the proper uh, insights into what that market wants, okay? Finally, um, why are you excited about working about the idea? This is one of the criteria I think of when, uh, when I'm, I'm, I'm evaluating a pitch, is do the founders seem excited about their own idea? And does me hearing about it make me excited about it? Um, again, you see quite a bit when people are just trying to start a startup for the sake of doing it or because they think it's a cool thing to do, um, they, they make up an idea and they aren't particularly attached to the idea and they're already considering that it may not work at all, right? Whereas when you talk to someone that's truly excited about what they're doing, it's, it's contagious and you can get the sense that even if a lot of roadblocks are put in front of the founder, they're so excited about their idea and they're so passionate about it, they will overcome all that adversity. Because the fact is, when you're, when you're starting a startup, people are going to tell you no, they're going to reject you, and you're going to be humiliated on a daily basis. The world is going to tell you you're wrong. And so if you aren't excited about your idea, there's absolutely no way that you're going to have the wherewithal to make it, uh, <laughs> to, make it to the point of being successful. And so that's why this point is, is so necessary, and you want to see someone that can get an investor excited, they can get, get partners excited, they can get uh, investors excited, they can get employees excited. So excitement is very key to um, evaluating if a founder and idea are the right match. So let's talk about a few pitfalls uh, when you're evaluating a startup idea. Communication is the single most important thing um, for, for getting a company off the ground. Um, there's definitely a tendency of folks to use buzzwords um, and to use jargon and corporate speak when, when talking about what it is they're doing. And yeah, Brendan talked about this in his previous talk, but it's often quite difficult uh, when you're speaking to someone to even know what they do. And I hear you know, a very high percentage of pitches that I hear personally are full of jargon and full of, of corporate language. And the actual, you know, all I want to know is, well, what does your thing do and who wants it? <laughs> and it takes, sometimes you have to like pull it out of the founder when they're communicating it to you. And often it's because people are nervous or maybe they don't really have it figured out themselves. But I think it's very important to know how to communicate using simple words and plain language, exactly what your thing is and why people want it. And if you're unable to do that, <laughs> or if you're unable to get excited about it, that's a sign it's probably not a good idea. Um, the best ideas tend to be ones you can communicate very, very simply. And I, I wish more folks would practice this simple communication rather than to sound impressive by using jargon. Um, here's another pitfall is that a lot of the mentorship that's out there and a lot of the resources available to startups um, start with what you do once you already have product market fit. So the metaphor I use here is imagine um, you want to be a world-class runner and go to the Olympics. Would it be better to learn how to negotiate your Nike sponsorship, um, how to do the Olympic preparation, how to hire a doctor and have a staff, or would it be better to just learn how to train and get good at running? And the reason I bring up this metaphor is that so many of the resources are like, oh, well, how do you raise an angel round? How do you build a team? And it skips over the earliest parts of the startup. If you have something that's actually taking off, investors will find you. If you have something that's actually taking off, uh, people that are journalists will find you. The world tends to find things that are taking off and pull you into its success. Uh, and if you feel that you're constantly having to push out there um, and work on fundraising and work on PR, and you don't have the core of your product done, you're gonna have a very difficult time. Um, another thing is that a lot of the way, um, I think this is mostly because of the press, a lot of the way people think about startups is that 
the scorecard for who is successful and who is not successful is who raises the most money. And the way that people on the outside evaluate if something is working or not is that you read that they raised money. And this is not true. This is simply untrue. The amount of money you raise and the, um, the press that you read about all this great stuff happening gives you, does not give you insight into if the product is working and into a success. I would call fundraising a trailing indicator of, of the product uh, of the company hitting milestones. And the fact is, when you talk to founders, and I myself have been a founder and raised many rounds of funding, um, it actually gets harder every time you raise money because the stakes are raised and because the size of your company gets bigger. And sometimes it gets even harder to grow when you raise money. And so it's really important to separate in your own mind as a potential founder uh, the difference between truly being successful and making a product that people want and just trying to raise money because that's how you define external success. Um, another thing that we see a lot is what we call cargo cult startups, and I'm sure that doesn't translate very well. Um, but essentially, it's, it's people that have all the accoutrements, that have all the external views of success, um, but aren't actually focusing on making a product that people want. So what you'll see is people, uh, they rent an office space, they, they hire a full staff of people, they have a lot of consultants, C-level executives, um, but they don't actually, they can't exactly tell you what they do. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's all about seeming successful from the outside and feeling like they're, they're acting the way s startups are supposed to act. And this is a very dangerous trap that people fall into. Um, so, again, like, you should define success as if you're building a product that your users care about and if you're growing and try to stay away from the idea of conforming to what you see from television and movies on what a successful startup is supposed to look like. And the folks that do this have a very hard time. These kinds of companies tend to not work. Um, yeah. So while we're on the topic of ideas, we funded some very crazy stuff. Uh, we funded quantum computing, rocketry, fusion reactors, fission reactors. Uh, we're working a lot on AI. We, we really are open-minded about the kinds of things we fund. Um, and the fact is that Often founders, um, they don't do big ideas because they think they wouldn't be fundable. So instead, they try to build photo sharing apps or, or, or things like that. And the fact is, um, we're interested in funding more kind of big ideas. And you have to start very, very simple with these kinds of ideas, though. Um, and so, so the way, how do you get one of these really big ideas off the ground is you have to start really simple, really crisp, with a small group of people that will be your first users and bring it to market. and and start iterating with these folks, right? That's how you would start one of those really bold, crazy companies. And I'll give you an example in a second. Um, on the other hand, you have these ocean boiler ideas where um, people don't actually, they just want to build a technology. They don't know who their users are. They don't know how the customers are. They don't know who actually needs it. Uh, we call this solution in search of a problem. And th this, is a, this is as difficult as boiling the ocean. And so trying to take this very vague approach to building uh, hard technology uh, rarely works. Um, and yeah, it requires a lot of capital. That's the reason a lot of these don't work, is you need to raise quite a bit of money to get this to market. So I think you would say successful ideas can look like multi-stage rockets. And what that means is there's different steps. Uh, you just want to get, you want to build something very simple that makes a small number of people happy. And then when you get to the next st step, get more ambitious in your idea. And so all you're focusing on is not what it looks like when you have, say, a quantum computer, or you built a nuclear reactor, or you've uh, revolutionized transportation. It never sounds like that, and that's never what the founders say in the early days. Instead, they focus on these really concrete things. So let me give you an example of Airbnb. Um, that's a Y Combinator company. I knew the founders when they first started, and I remember thinking it was a pretty stupid idea. Um, and the fact is, they had no ambition in the early days of becoming the kind of company they are now. They wouldn't tell you, oh, Airbnb is going to take over the world, and it's going to be bigger than hotels someday, and we're going to be worth billions, and we're going to disrupt everything. Like, absolutely, that is not how it was described. Rather, they were focused on, hey, wouldn't it be great when hotels are sold out in a city if you could just stay, out, stay at someone's house? And they themselves were solving a problem. They needed the money, actually, to pay their rent <laughs> because they were broke for their apartment. And so there was a big uh, conference happening in San Francisco, um, and they rented out their apartment. 
they, they sent out an email blast to a mailing list and, says, and said, does anyone need a place to stay? And they wrenched out their apartment to complete strangers. And that's actually how Airbnb started. That's how this revolutionary company that's changed the world and probably a lot of people have stayed in started was people solving a very simple problem that they themselves had and that was not glamorous and was not full of jargon. And I think, you know, if you look at a lot of the founding stories of very large companies, they start off with these very humble beginnings. And so this is a good way to think about how to, how to approach a really big idea is to start really simple. Um, and yes, it has to solve a real problem for the people in it. And it's nice to have network effects such that the more users that it has, uh, the more successful things become. And the other thing is people m would make fun of the Airbnb folks because it seemed like such a dumb idea. Um, and so to sometimes it's um, counterintuitively to have a simple idea, you have to be willing to take more social rejection that what you're working on seems trivial or stupid versus things that, that sound very difficult. So anyway, those are some ideas on how, how to come up with an idea. And I just wanted to list, uh, to close out, just the, the top causes of death for startups. Um, the number one reason a startup doesn't work um, is that people don't want the thing they're making. That's it, right? This, and this is why I think it's worth talking about ideas, is if you, if you make something that people don't want at step one, there's, you're just not gonna succeed. And so it's really worth thinking about things at that stage. The number two is co-founder disputes. So the team is very key. And the third thing is uh, that you don't find a way to grow or scale a way to get customers. And notice these things aren't, uh, couldn't raise financing, right? These things aren't technical risk, right? It's not the things that, peop that founders like to talk about or think about that makes them fail. It's actually these things. And so that's why I think it's really worth talking about the ideas. Um, anyway, that's it for me. Thanks for listening.